This is mostly a response to an Mendem's video, um, or a couple of videos that he's done, but um, some people have made some interesting comments in the comments section of my previous video that I'd like to address. Artificer in particular, um, and Phoenix Chastain in my name. Um, okay, there's <coughs> the discussion seems in some way, uh, in some fashion, to devolve <coughs> to what can we do about this. It seems that we've kind of agreed that it's arguable, it's a sustainable argument that life is kind of not what it promises. I think most of us actually see it this way in our more clear moments, clear-headed moments where, you know, you we all live in this post-industrial society <coughs> that you know, whenever you're exposed to the media, which is constantly now, they've placed TV screens everywhere. Um, everything is telling you that things are better than they actually are. And you sort of think, well, wait a second. Now, I'm not going to say that it's a conspiracy, because at the end of the day, all that the media really, I think, wants is your money. Um, which is kind of, it's, as opposed to a conspiracy, it's kind of autopilot. Society has decided that money is what matters, and the media is there to get your money. Get your, get your money by getting your attention. And getting you to use your money to purchase the ideals that are broadcast to you all the time. <coughs> now, I think most of us in our more, as I say, pensive moments, know that this, this, there is a, a disconnect between how society seeks to portray itself or how the human condition seeks to portray itself and how things really are. You even look at a sad movie or a depressing movie and there's always some sort of drama about it. There's also always some sort of Nietzschean affirmation of everything in it to say that, okay, this was a sad story, but um, again, I come from the Irish culture and we just love sad stories and stories about failure and stories about betrayals and things like that. Um, but there are ways to fail that are not considered failures, if you know what I'm saying. It's the, the you die on your feet type thing. Um, even that is kind of a, I don't know, a fib really, because it, it still says be part of all of this. Even if you're going to fail at it, you can fail gloriously. Um, I, I don't really buy that view of things, but I think that, I think, a lot of people, or most of us, do question it. I don't think there's such a thing as the stereotypical consumer. There's, you know, you've seen these artworks of enormously obese people sitting in front of a screen, and there's garbage all around them, and they're just stuffing more food and beer and pornography into themselves, and that's it. I don't think anyone is at that point, or there may be some people, I guess, in the extreme, but I don't think everybody uh, or anybody really buys all of that. But I think people are kind of undecided as to what to do about it all. What's the prescription now? Like, it, maybe this is just as good as everything gets, so we might as well go on, go along with it. Um, now, once you start to sort of go beyond this, once you start to step out and see that this is the dynamic of the civilization we live in, you end up asking yourself, what now? What do I do? When you start seeing that you know, you're in something of a hamster wheel of existence that, or I wouldn't even say a hamster wheel because the hamster just runs because he likes to run. Uh, it's To me, it's more like the carrot on the end of the stick that's just slightly out of reach for your whole life. Um, we've always known in this, if you read the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes is full of that, um, you know, about the futility of existence and um, religions strongly teach the futility of existence, you know, riches in heaven, not on earth, that kind of thing. Um, you owe everything to God, and, you know, don't think that any of this in the world is really going to serve your own purposes, that kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> this is where the paths, I think, divide. Now, I think most people sort of go for the renunciant uh, view of things. Once they get to that jaded kind of 
view of things. Um, the good uh, case of that is the say the the twelve step programs that you see for recovering addicts. Because in many ways, I agree, modern the modern civilization we live in is just a way to feed all of our addictions. Um, or if you want to use terms like crude crude terms like addictions, perhaps. Um, I would say that it's just a means of palliating us. It's not so much that we're addicted to everything, because I don't even I don't even know if any if and any people actually reach a momentary satisfaction through consumer capitalism. Uh, I don't know. It, I, it doesn't strike me that they would, but perhaps they do. I don't know. I can't get into their minds and see what utility they get out of it. Um, I do know when I question this edifice of consumer capitalism, I often get a very hostile response from such people. Um, like, who do you think you are? You know, this kind of thing. And I've always been a person that most people, believe it or not, actually like me, but the people that dislike me truly hate me. Uh, I really make enemies in life. Um, enemies are, you know, people that want to do me harm. And what I think it is is my tendency to disturb their peace of mind. I just love to do that. Um, or I don't even love to do it, it just seems to be in my nature to do it. I always ask questions, I question absolutely everything. So you question somebody's anchors, I guess, and you're, you get the feeling that they believe that you're pushing them to some sort of precipice. Um, now, think of it this way. Um, a renunciant point of view, i got a hair hanging down in front of my eyes, it's bugging me. Maybe I should buzz my hair off my hair. I always do this, these videos in the morning when I have bedhead, so I have to put a hat on. Um, I look at it this way. A renunciant is ultimately pursuing an ideal. Now, that's what I would see it as. I think a lot of renunciants would say, I'm actually abandoning all ideals. But it looks to me as though they're abandoning all their little ideals for one big one. And the big one is some sort of unaffected bliss. Unaffected, you know, the, the Hindus say Satchitananda, awareness, or sorry, being um, awareness and bliss, or being knowledge and bliss, whatever you want to call it. That's what we want. The way to get it is renunciation. Um, yes, but there's renunciation out of fear, and there's re renunciation out of love for an ideal or there's renunciation out of cynicism. There's any number of reasons why one might renounce, and they're not always clear. Um, I tend to see it sort of... I tend to see renunciation as more or less a learning process where you say, okay, I'm looking for something here. I don't find it here. Where else do I go? Um, whereas I've always thought of the renunciant as saying, there is nothing that will satisfy me. I'm out of here. Um, now... The way that I would characterize that is, it's inevitably it devolves, in, from my perspective, to some form of belief. Some form of belief, like when I see certain practices, like um, Buddhist meditation practices, for example, or even Christian stuff or whatever, it seems to be aimed at. Um, Preparing yourself to meet an ideal. Preparing yourself, working in a long step towards an ideal that is up there and it's difficult to describe, but we know that it's there or we believe that it's there or whatever, and it's, it's going to take time. You have to follow a set of progression, like a ladder. You have to follow a ladder to get to where you want to go. Um, <clears throat> now, what motivates you at the end of this is the idea that once I get, to, you know, once I reach the end of the rainbow, there will be a pot of gold there. Now, that strikes me as belief. And because it says you're not, you're not at the pot of gold now, but you may be, or you will be, if you pursue this path, this sadhana, which the, uh, you know, the, the Hindus use as their spiritual path, their, the word for whatever their spiritual vocation turns in, out to be. Whatever the practices are, it's your sadhana, it's your way of applying your convictions, I guess. 
which, as I say, I don't think Western philosophy is quite to that extent. I think the ancient Greeks were. like the, We would have probably seen the Pythagoreans or the Epicureans or something as a religious cult if we'd seen them. Um, because they did, they seemed to, to have all the, the trappings of that, you know, the guru and all this sort of thing. I don't think that they were quite as ivory towerish as we are now with philosophy. I think that living philosophy is still something relatively new in the West, at least in the West since the Enlightenment. Um, <clears throat> so they're they're positing this ideal that's out there now. And that ideal can mean any number of things. Like, if you read Ligotti's Red Tower, he's, his, his ideal is non-existence. Some people read even the Buddhist, the Buddha's Nirvana as non-existence, but what do you mean by non-existence? You, you know, it's like your own individual ego is no longer exists, but something exists of which you are now identified. But again, it says, if you do this, this will happen. Um, Ligotti po posits non-existence as some sort of an ideal. Um, I'm inclined to sort of challenge that, and I said I didn't really want to get into that, but I would sort of say, how do you know that that's going to be the ideal that you think it is? How do you know? How do you know it's really going to accomplish anything by doing that, by renouncing to that to that extent? Um, and now, again, I know that there are counter-arguments to all of this, and it the, the discussions some are very easily can devolve to finger pointing to say this is why your side of the equation is wrong as opposed to this is why I believe my side of this is right in other words instead of renouncing this is why I choose this all I'm trying to do is explain what I see as my objections to that point of view um, this is and, and as I say I'm, I'm very skeptical of any resolution here because this is something that's been argued since people started to argue about existential things, this denial or, or this renunciation versus embracing, uh, versus affirmation or whatever. Um, now, I see the difference between a, an affirmer and a renunciant as the, uh, the affirmer says, forget all your ideals. They're illusions just like everything else is. Um, just like the illusion of finding meaning in gratifying your senses, at least as you, at least in a half, you know, a half cock kind of way, as your stereotypical consumer, all you do is you just draw more stuff into yourself pell mell, and you don't really um, pay attention to the overall process. You just deliberately become an object of the outside world. You're simply that which receives everything, and you put nothing into it. You are a consumer in the purest sense. You just consume stuff. And you don't even discipline the way in which you consume. You just live to consume. And not only that, our society is so structured that people like that are essential. In order to maintain our civilization, there have to be consumers. Now, there's a thought, eh? Um, and consumers in the kind of the... If, kind of way, you know, just your stereotypical Walmart denizen, you know, who spends his life there or online on the shopping sites or whatever while he's eating and drinking beer and surfing pornography or whatever. <clears throat> the renunciant would say, we want to escape all of that because something is better at the end of the rainbow um, if we follow the right procedures. Now, the, the discussion we're talking about here is preventing sentient life. Now, I would say we don't know that, we don't know what creates sentience. We don't know if sentience can really be destroyed. Um, we don't know what consciousness is. Um, we know that consciousness is, though. We don't know what it is. Um... So I would say that I, I, I get what you're saying, you know, to the renunciant. I know what you're saying in terms of not wanting to believe in what's around you. You know, the prescriptives that are thrown at you all the time because there's an interest, a larger interest at play here 
um, be a good consumer because it's good for everybody. And ultimately, if you're not being a good consumer, you're being selfish or you're being damaging to society or you're not adding anything because, again, capitalism relies on people buying the stuff that's on the shelves. If you don't do that, you're endangering the civilization you're in. Well, if you do do that, say the environmentalists, you're also endangering everything. So, again, you, you get that butterfly effect where it's impossible not to cause danger. You can you can characterize any action or inaction as dangerous. I'm sure you've had that argument thrust in your face before. You're, what you're doing is dangerous. What you think is dangerous. I would say, is there any way to not do something dangerous? Even withdrawing from civilization completely is, you know, say some people dangerous. You know, it's we can't have that. Um, so the affirmer would not say. Seek nir nirvana there and then. They say, if you want to seek it, seek it here and right now. Um, don't go looking for it. Don't set yourself this plan saying, I'm going to follow these steps and eventually I'll get to where I want. I'll be a ninth level whatever monk and at this level of proficiency or whatever. A lot of people do actually, though, I find when they get into this sort of thing, they do sort of start to think linearly as well. I do yoga, and, and uh, one of the things that kind of irritates me, and I have to sort of be conscious of this, is when I go to a yoga class, and I see, uh, and I rarely do this, by the way, I don't go to yoga class, I see people who seem to sort of see it as a fitness routine, or as something with a goal or a telos to it, as opposed to doing it as an end in itself. They want to improve. They say, "I got to work on this posture. I got to work on that, 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 that." Now, that that could sort of be an innocuous thing to say because they just want to improve themselves, of course, and we all want to do that. But it kind of invalidates the moment of becoming and says that what matters is the future. But the future will be a moment of becoming, and the past was a moment of becoming. Um, and Mendham said that the those who know must correct those who don't. Um, well, I would say, how do we know that we can even do that, do, given the limitations of communication and everything? How do we know that, that first of all, i got to know that I actually know something? And remember, knowing nothing and knowing you know nothing are not the same thing. It, you know, if, if you know nothing but you don't know you, you know nothing, then... You're not in as advantageous a position as Socrates was when he knew nothing, and he knew that he knew nothing. Um, how do you teach somebody that they know nothing when you yourself believe that you know nothing, and that's an, an, an advantageous point of view? Uh, first, you've got to sort of demolish whatever, whatever everybody else happens to believe in. Then you've got to be there to deal with the nihilism or the negative nihilism that results. Why would I want to do that? You know, why would I want to do that to somebody? Why would I want to put myself and them through all of this? I don't think I would. Uh, in fact, I would think it's a colossal waste of time, and I think that that's ultimately where cults and organized religion come from. Um, but again, you're going to... You, it's so easy to characterize my point of view as a cult simply because of how, I don't know, weird it all is. I get it. I understand why people would characterize it that way. And I understand, and I fully understand, why people mischaracterize this point of view and always have the esoteric point of view of things. I get it. I understand that. And, you know, it, it, that's why, I, you know, you need a pretty thick skin to be into this kind of thing. You're going to be misunderstood, and you're going to be met with hostility. Something that, again, I fully sympathize with, say, an Ephelist or something. I, you know, People are going to hate you for it, okay? So, <laughs> who wants medals from these people? As you know, the guy said in uh, Harrison Ford said in that Russian submarine movie. Why do I want accolades from people who believe all all this stuff that I find so, I don't know, unconvincing? I don't want them to. In fact, the more they hate me, the almost the better I feel about my own convictions. This is something that I think most esoterics and most extreme renunciants would feel. Um, and a, an extreme renunciant, I guess, would be somebody who just thinks that life just really is not at all worth living and has some ideas to what to do about it all. 
So, <clears throat> I don't know that we actually can de-ignorance somebody else. Um, and I don't know that there is an ideal out there that's worth pursuing. I don't. I don't, th I don't see non-existence as an ideal because I know that existence is. Even if I don't even know what existence is, I know that something is. Uh, that's my riposte to artificer. You don't have to call my me an I. Whatever it is, something is perceiving that which is perceived. Something is understanding that which the brain allows it to understand. Something is in possession of the information that is stored on the hard drive. On the hard drive, there's no information. Information implies perception. Um, we can say that perception is a mere emergent property of the brain, okay, but that also implies that the brain has to exist in order for there to be perception. So, again, you're just, there's no way around the cogito, uh, or at least a certain reading of the cogito. Like, what does it mean? What does I mean when you say, I think, therefore I am? What do you, what, what does that I mean? Huh. I would say something thinks, ergo, something exists or something cogitates, ergo, something exists. Um, so what do, you, what do you do with all of this? Um, as I say, the, to me there's only the moment of becoming. And there's another reason why I would, why I would say that is, is that if you have a linear conception of causality, then something has to be the thing that Something is moving through this. Now, again, a lot of what Mendem has been saying reminds me of the Jain view of karma, like his rolling snowball. That's how the Jains kind of see individual existence. There is that which exists, whatever it is, and karma accumulates on that snowball, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it mixes with other things, and pretty soon they're crashing into other uh, snowballs and this kind of thing. And the best way to the best way to deal with that is to reverse the process that caused snow to stick to the very the ultimate beginning essence of snowballism in the first place. That which around which the snowball was built uh, is the snowball just its own layers, or is there something inherently snowballish about it? A linear conception of time assumes that there is something fundamentally there that all that snow will stick to. Um, again, that's the Jain view of karma. Um, and, it, and karma assumes identity. There doesn't seem to be any way around that. Karma assumes that there is an I. If you're going to use a snowball as something that exists, pre-exists and then has more stuff added to it, you're assuming that something existed in the first place to build the snowball around type thing. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with that. It may look that way because I have memories, right? I have memories of things that I did and I experienced in the past. I'm not sure how accurate those memories are, but I know that I do have memories. Okay, and they somehow, somewhat relate to what apparently actually happened when I cross-reference with other people's versions of the event. We might not agree 100%, but it does. There's something out there that we that we can sink our teeth into and agree to call the past. Um. But to that I would say, I would look at it this way. In a deterministic sense, what can I do about my own past? Like, isn't... I would say, isn't your past almost part of that which you can't control? Like... Right now, what can I do about my own past? Nothing. So I would say that you can't sort of say that I am now responsible for what I did in the past when there's absolutely nothing I can do to change the past. Then they say, well, is somebody else responsible for it? Maybe nobody is responsible for it. I mean, it's in the past, therefore it's beyond our reach. So I would sort of approach... Gary's snowball metaphor that way, or the Jain view of karma, I'm not sure that I agree with that, because it assumes that in the present, I am responsible 
for that which happened in the past, even if though even if that which seems to be me right now did that. But I still I, I can only be responsible for something that I can change. I cannot change the past. It's completely out of my hands. Um a Jane would say, Well you, nobody's asking you to change it. We're just asking you to reverse it, which is different from changing it. But I would say that obligation comes out of some sort of sense that I actually can change the past, or because I did something in the past, I am therefore now in something of a deficit. I hate to say it, guilt. Um, this flies totally in the face of our own ideas of personal responsibility, I get it. But and, and I understand what would happen if we actually put this into practice. Well, suddenly we would have no civilization anymore. We would just have Hobbesian chaos, wouldn't we? Because nobody would be responsible for anything, and people could do whatever they want. This is why I say this is not a philosophy for the many. And it never has been, and it never will be. Um, the many simply do not see things this way. They see the past as something set. They see human identity or personal identity is something absolute and or at least they seem to and if I did something in the past 20 years ago that I cannot expunge and they, it catches up to me now even though I had completely learned my lesson and would never do it again I still must go to jail why because if we allow you to get away with it everybody else is going to be doing it okay I understand the deterrent thingy but again that's not the way that most people see it you got your just desserts, you bastard. You know, ideas like nemesis or whatever. So, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I'm not sure that I agree that 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 there is any obligation for me to do anything ever um, based on what I have done in the past or based on where I find myself now. Because can any of us alter where we are in the causal chain. No. We are where we are. We are all subjects of necessity. Um, we're, or we're all subject to necessity. There's a webcam right in front of me right now. There's nothing I can do about that. I can only take steps to make sure that in the future it's not in front of me. But if I don't take those steps, and it's still in front of me. Is it my fault that the webcam is now in front of me? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is kind of a weird topic to get into, but I'm trying to ex to explain the point of view of being in the driver's seat, in the moment of becoming, what it actually seems like when you're there and when you're trying to analyze it and everything. Um, my past, even if I was complicit in my own past has now become something determined I cannot change my past so in a moral sense how can I possibly be responsible for it if I murdered somebody yesterday I think that it would be reasonable for the police to come and apprehend me but not reasonable because I deserve to be apprehended but because we can't live in a civilization in which people murder others. You understand the difference between those two. Um, so when Mendham says that I have the obligation to de-ignorant the ignorant, I would, I would challenge him, where does that obligation come from? How is, you know, how am I my brother's keeper in any way at all? Um in terms of obligation. If I do it out of obligation, then, okay, uh, that assumes that I do have that obligation, which I'm not sure that I do. But I would say I have certain social obligations only based upon my idea, uh, my, my desire to live as untroubled an existence as I can, which is, I think, the best that we can do with human society is the social contract. So, maybe I don't have a moral obligation to answer for everything that I've done because it's out of my hands but all that we can do is we can sort of say if you break society's rules in that way this will happen and that will hopefully cut back on very destructive behavior where it gets ugly is when you sort of think what this guy is saying is going to lead to nasty behavior 
which is why, of course, esoterics are so often burned at the stake. Um, you know, it's uh, especially by renunciants. Um, and again, you see the the danger of what I'm saying. Think about that. Esoterics are often burnt at the stake, especially by renunciants. You see wh where that can go if you're not careful. 